to order the uh, Planning Commission Citizens Advisory Committee for the uh, regular uh, meeting of Monday, September 10th, 2018. Please uh, rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. Uh, Sue, roll call, please. Commissioner Breimeyer? Here. Commissioner Cagwalder? Here. Commissioner Chambers? Here. Commissioner Ellis? Here. Commissioner Plank? Here. Commissioner Schrobin? Here. And Chair Barker? Here. Thank you. Uh, do I have a, uh, a motion for approval of the agenda as, it, as it's written? Motion to approve it. In a second. And discussion. All in favor of uh, approving the agenda as written, please say aye. 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 Agenda is approved. Uh, and do I have a motion for the approval of the uh, minutes of the uh, previous meeting, August 13th, our regular meeting? Motion for that. And support? Support. Aye. And discussion? All in favor of accepting the minutes as written, please say aye. 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 Stands accepted. Uh, public comments? There appears to be nobody here tonight, so we will dispense with that. Um, old business, residential zoning districts review uh, updated. And I think, um, Andy, I think you wanted to take a look at the Chapter 15, the flood planned unit development. You want to go through that first? Yes, yeah. uh, we can do either one first. Um, so today I submitted um, to you a couple of, of updates. So the, the residential zoning districts, if you recall, we went over that last month. We just kind of walked through a bunch of the proposed changes to the definitions, to the land uses, list of permitted and uh, special land uses, and the dimensional standards. You'll see basically all we did in this new version of this memo is um, took out all of the straight throughs and we kept the highlights so you can see what's new and keep that in mind. We took out the rest of the stuff. And you'll also see uh, it didn't come through real well in the copy, so I'll clean that up a little bit. We have graphics for each of the, of the districts now. So if you look on starting on page, let's see, in the definitions on page four of the report, we have a, uh, we added a graphic that more clearly illustrates the, the lot line was a front yard, was a side yard, and all that kind of stuff in the zoning ordinance. <coughs> this is primarily helpful for staff and the public. Um, you guys typically don't need to, you know, parse this out in all that much detail, but uh, I do on a surprisingly frequent basis. Where we talk about principal front yards versus secondary front yards, what setback applies when, and that kind of thing. So we added a graphic here, so it's less confusing for residents when they're trying to figure that out. Similarly, on page, um, I'm going to kind of skip ahead a little bit here. Uh, pages six and seven is basically the same thing as you saw last month. I uh, just cleaned up a little bit on page eight. Uh, there's a graphic again that just illustrates the setback for the SR district. So we, we kind of copied this, this format for graphics through each of the districts that show the building envelopes, that show the setbacks, lot boundaries, the, the minimum lot width, all of those kinds of things. So it's a, a little bit easier to understand hopefully when we say, oh, you're you know, your front yard has to be 30 feet or something. They understand what that means and how that relates to where they can build a house and things of that nature. Uh, similarly, on page 10, we have a graphic for the R2 district. Uh, on page 12, 13, we have one for the R2 district. So, um, again, that's really the only change that we made to this residential districts chapter. We also have one on page 16 for the R3 district. And it's just to help illustrate the concepts of, and, and, and the setback. We find that people have a much easier time understanding the pictures and reading through the text. Uh, so this, coupled with the other graphics, illustrate what the front, you know, primary front yards and secondary front yards are, along with these graphics, should help understand a little bit better. Uh, it'll help people understand a little bit better which you know, which regulations apply and why it's like that and, and all that kind of stuff. And just a quick question or clarification. We've got one set here that has our agenda on it. 
Yep. And that one, okay. that's the one from last month, from August 9th. So that's that's just that one, right? And yep. And then the newer one, one is new one has, from takes out all strikes and yes. does all of that and has the yep. graphics. Yes. So when we're going through this, we really won't need this. Yeah. We will just need this. Is that correct? Yes. So moving forward to now, the one that we submitted to council will probably have both, but. Right. When we turn this into an ordinance format, we'll take out the highlighting and everything, and you'll just see what's going to be what's there. Actually there. Yeah. Um, but we left the highlights in just so you can kind of right. remember what. And I what think the there. council preferred to have the highlights. Right? Yeah, I think we gave them both last time for, for parking and signs, and they it was pretty easy for them to understand the changes. Right. I think that's what they said. Yep. Okay. So we will continue to do that if that works okay for you. Yep. Um, are there any questions on the residential districts at this point or additional comments or anything on the graphics that we added? I just have a question about yeah. um, setbacks. Mm -hmm. It's just in general. Just, but, so why is there, for the minimum side yard setback, there's a number here that says 20 foot total slash 8 foot minimum. Yes. And for all others, there's just a number that I would assume is a minimum. Right. Uh, side yards, we see that a lot. So what that means is that one side, each side yard has to be at least eight feet, but together total they have to be 20. So if one side is eight, the other side's got to be 12. Okay. Or it's 10 and 10, or they can both be 12 or 15 or whatever, but there has to be a minimum. And that's in there for, uh, I, I believe that's a, that's a provision that, uh, helps with access a lot, so if like a fire truck or some other emergency vehicle has got to get between houses if you only have like a you know three or a five or you know fairly narrow setback it's hard to get through there. So when you have that that yeah, 20 house. combined and you have one side of the house they can get through there pretty easily. So you can access three to seventeen or two eighteen. Well it's gotta be at least eight. So so it's eight and twelve is your minimum. So so you couldn't do like a 7 and a 13. The pre-existing things are fine. Yes. Right. Yeah, so pre-existing things would be you know, what we call non-conforming. We talked about this a while back. So they would be allowed to continue moving forward now if that house was you know, destroyed or burned out or something. When they rebuilt it, they would have to conform to the new standards. But moving forward, yes, that's something that would be allowed to, to continue, provided it was there legally to be. I don't, I don't think I've ever seen it either. Is this something new or a new idea? No, a lot of orders that have those. I see it quite a bit. Okay. I've just um, never seen it. Mm -hmm. oh. So my house is like probably three feet off the lot line. Mm -hmm. So if it burned down, I've got to move the foundation. Is that what you're saying? It, it depends on the percentage um, and specific circumstances, but uh, in most cases, if it's like more than 60 or 70 percent destroyed completely, then uh, possibly, yes. I mean, again, that's that's a real common thing in zoning where if there's a if there's a major calamity, then um, and there's a house or a structure of some sort that's not conforming, whether it's a house or a garage or a commercial business somewhere, um, if it's if it gets destroyed and it gets rebuilt, then it has to be rebuilt in a manner that complies with the ordinance. Um, so I think I have to check the ordinance. There, there there might be a provision in there that allows for someone to appeal the counselors or something like that to, to get around that. Um, but generally speaking, yes, you would have to conform when you rebuild. Or keep one wall up. <laughs> Do something. <laughs> Don't burn that wall. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Now this this is the one here too. These residential districts are the ones where we will still have to have a public hearing. Correct. Because this is the first we've seen this. Uh, well, we we talked about it last month with this. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, yes. So um, as far as scheduling yet, that's up to the commission. If you want to do it next month, we can turn around an ordinance in time and, and notice it. If you want to look at this more closely and digest it, since you did only get it today, that's fine too. I mean, we're not in a huge rush to. You know, just run through this if you're not comfortable. That's up to you. Commissioners, what's what's your take on if you want to schedule a public hearing for our October 8th meeting on the residential districts? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. 
I don't see any overriding reason to not do it, frankly. All right, let's, let's go ahead and schedule that then. So this will be at the October 8th public hearing. Correct? Yes. And these are all the residential districts only. Yes, correct. So we still have not done the industrial districts. We haven't done the commercial districts. So there's just a few more districts to go. Right. Uh, I'm just double checking the date here, but that's not true. Yep. Um, if you're good with that, we'll move on to the next one. So this is a little out of order. Um, we had talked originally about moving on to the commercial districts. Um, but instead, I also sent today um, a quick rework of the PUD Planned Unit Development District. And we did that um, because there is some, some interest in uh, some development in the city that we are interested in um, you know, accommodating, I guess. And the way that we'd like to handle this is by looking at our Planned Unit Development District standards, because I think. In this particular instance, it'll, it'll work the best. So um, I've gone through this chapter 15 and made some initial edits that I think it made it overall workable. And so to kind of provide some background here on what a PUD is, I know you guys probably hear that term a lot, but I don't know if I mean, not everyone is really interested in reading about PUDs just for leisure. Um, but what a plan unit development is, is it's, it's a mechanism in zoning that allows for flexibility in development. So what a lot of times what we see um, in all kinds of development is when you apply just a, if you develop a piece of property and you apply an R1 or an R2 or a commercial zoning district regulation, you get kind of a repetitive pattern. So you have houses of a similar size and a similar style built on a lot of the same size on the same type of street um, with with, with the same setback and this pattern just continues on and on and on and on. Um, there are a number of instances all over the, I mean, just in just in, in this area and you know within the you know within the Lowell area or within just West Michigan generally where there are properties that don't lend themselves well to having the entire thing just completely developed. There are lakes, there are wetlands, there are rivers, there are important things that you want to preserve. Um, and so the PUD allows for a lot of deviation of those underlying zoning requirements. So instead of hypothetically, let's say you have a one acre minimum lot, but there's all this cool stuff that you want to preserve, you could not allow the developer, for example, to um, build smaller lots than what you would normally permit, as long as they preserve this other stuff that you want them to preserve, or if they you know, have a trail network going through there, um, or something like that. Uh, in, in the city's case, it might be more um, it might be more relevant to say that there, there could be a piece of property in, in the city like a block. If, let's say somebody bought a block that didn't have much on it, or there, maybe there was one building and they wanted to work around that building, but they couldn't do what they wanted to do using the, the conventional sort of district requirements. So in a PUD, the city can waive and vary and modify a lot of that stuff as long as they go forward with this plan that would be specifically approved by both the planning commission and the city council. So it's, it's, it's a way for the city to allow for kind of innovation and interesting non-traditional types of, of development. Um, a lot of PUDs also allow for varying land uses. So if there's property that's zoned R1 or R2, or if it's in a commercial zone, but the, but there's a developer that says, I want to do a mixed use project on, on this parcel. We could zone it to mixed use, that might work, or we could allow for a PUD, which could allow for those additional land uses, and also the variation of setbacks, of um, parking, of density, of lot coverage, and that kind of thing. So it's really a, a tool to allow for innovative design and flexibility in, in standards. So, and do we have currently in Lowell any PUDs? Yes, you have one. Where is that? It's, uh, yeah, the, is that Highland Hill, is that what it's called? Yeah, okay. so just go around on the east side of town. That's a PUD. Okay. That's a great example of why you would do that. So that's a hilly property, and so what they've done is you can see, just looking on the map there, or looking on the zoning map, 
most likely under the conventional zoning when that was done, the only way to fit that number of lots on that property would just be to kind of slice up the whole thing into individual parcels of, of, of the same size and have nothing preserved and then develop it that way. But that's a steep property getting back there and it's, it's a little tricky to develop on, on a conventional basis. So the city permitted a PV in that case, which allows for the smaller lots. All that stuff around it is, is preserved as open space. That's something that wouldn't necessarily have been feasible just under the conventional zoning ordinance standards. So that's an example of a PUD and why you do that. And again, we're in, in essence, if they have, if somebody does get a PUD, they in essence have their own zoning district. And it is a completely different zoning district. In this case, yes. Right? Yes. Okay. So in this in this in, in this case, what would happen if anyone applied for a PUD in the city and it was approved is by city council's approval, the property would be rezoned to PUD, and the site plan that they submitted with their PUD application would become part and parcel of that zoning. So yes, it's zoned to PUD, but that doesn't mean they can do anything. It means that whatever they've proposed and you have approved is what's locked in and it's zoned to for that and only that. Right. And you can't change that unless you come back and go through the, and, and go through the process again. So uh, to kind of walk through these, uh, these sections um, for you here in, in chapter 15. In section 15.01, we didn't make any changes other than a few comments and periods. Um, in section 15.02, um, there are some standards in here that I either took out like in, in the first one because uh, a lot of those generally aren't, don't apply to cities, though that's kind of a township oriented standard to me, preserving large stands of trees and open spaces and things like that. Um, the change I made on what's now number two, instead of areas on real property, it's just a board smithing thing that I preferred. Um, no changes in three, four, or five on page two under qualifying condition. There are a couple of things here that, um, again, didn't feel like it felt right for the city, so under subsection B, uh, what's now, or what was subsection two, where it says the property, which is the subject of the PUD, must be a minimum of five acres. I took that out uh, because there are opportunities in the, in the city, I think, to develop some kind of a PUD on property that is less than five acres in area. Um, under, under, under B, what is now B, B number two, I added a new subsection D. So again, this is more of a, something to tailor this more towards what the city might experience. The, so under section B2, it says to be considered as a PUD, the proposed development must fulfill at least one of the following. It contains two or more separate and distinct uses, for example, single or multifamily dwellings, and I'm adding mixed land uses, etc. cetera. Um, Item B, the PUD site exhibits significant natural features that encompass at least 25% of the land area. Uh, C, the PUD is designed to preserve in perpetuity at least 60% of the total lot area of the site. And then D, and this is something that I'm adding because again, I think it's relevant to what any small city might experience, is that the PUD con constitutes a significant redevelopment of an underutilized or vacant property where conventional development may not be feasible. So if there's a site that could be redeveloped in the city but want to have uh, options available for that person to pursue a reasonable redevelopment of the site. That's not to say that the city is just going to you know, sign a blank check over and say, do whatever you want. It still has to be approved by the Planning Commission, the City Council, and the standards of doing so in a minute here. Um, but I think this is important because you know, in mobile where, where, where there is some new development and there's some redevelopment of sites going on, this allows for additional flexibility uh, for the redevelopment of those parcels. Questions so far? Would there be any reason why we would want to have a minimum, not necessarily acreage, but a minimum amount of land use, or is that limiting what we're trying to do as a city? Um, you could, I mean, if, if you were to reduce, I mean, if you were to keep some minimum in there, though, the number that I would suggest you go down to is so small that it probably wouldn't be worth it anymore, so we could do a minimum of one acres or two acres or something like that, but I don't, I don't know what that accomplishes in this context. Okay. 
Yes. Sure. No. Yeah, that's a good question. This that that number that you see that five acres or ten acres, sometimes at twenty acres here in a township, I see that a lot. Yeah. And um, sometimes, especially in a city where like, you don't have twenty and forty and eighty, 80 acre parcels just laying around for people to develop, it's you know I question why we need that in there. Right. Okay. And I'm looking at the the map there and thinking about the river river beds or the river banks and. Is this uh, this be a good use of POD, wouldn't it, to be in that general area? Is this kind of what well be an application? I'm trying to think of an application where besides the development, sure, someone would want to come in and say, okay, I want to put condos along the river mm -hmm. down by the fairgrounds. Let's say. Yeah, I mean, if now I mean, a lot of the properties really close to the river here have floodplain issues that severely limit what you could do there. Um, but development on parcels like those could be an option. Um, any parcel that has, you know, a creek or wetlands or significant stands of trees on it, it could be useful. Um, redevelopment of a site somewhere in the in the downtown core. You know, if there's a block or a part of, you know, a larger parcel, relatively larger parcel, you know, downtown, near downtown, east side, west side, that someone said, you know what, I don't want to do what's the what the underlying zoning allows because that doesn't work for whatever reason i want to do something totally different but maybe it's a partial rehab of the building or maybe it's starting over with an empty site but you want to put the design completely different from what would ordinarily be required under the zoning ordinance this gives it that kind of flexibility right thank you um in section 15.03 this reviews the application procedure. I'm probably going to beat this part up a little bit um, moving forward, but essentially this just has an application to the Planning Commission. There would be a public hearing. The Planning Commission would make a recommendation to council who would have the final authority to adopt it. Um, the, the, both the Planning Commission, if you want, and the City Council would be required to hold a public hearing on APUD. And, um, as you mentioned, uh, Bruce, under subsection E here on page three, that I added approval of the PUD version to this chapter shall constitute an amendment to the city of Lowell zoning map. So that's that's the part where we're rezoning to, to PUD, and that's what triggers the need for a planning, or I'm sorry, for a city council public hearing. There's a there's some case law that requires that. Um, so we'll update that process a little bit, but so essentially, once the the property is zoned. PUD, then they can proceed with a basic site plan review of their project. And if they need a private road approval, if they need to go through a time committee or planning process on that parcel, they would do that. So, in essence, subsequent to the PUD result. I was going to say, so they have to have the PUD first, and then if if somebody got a PUD or whatever plan that they're kind of looking at, then, then they would have to go through an entire site plan as well. Correct. Um, using the PUD rules. Yes, because <coughs> absent the PUD rezoning, we look at the site plan promptly and say no, because this doesn't comply with whatever part of the zoning ordinance. So they need the flexibility within the PUD right. to to allow that. Now, when they submit the application for P, for PUD, they're going to have to tell you what they're doing anyway, so you're going to know. And some of them might even you know have kind of a concurrent re review process where you're looking at plan or a condominium or a site plan at the same time if they want to do that. Or you can have the PUD part track ahead a little bit of the site plan just so they have a more pre predictable process. That part is up to the applicant a little bit. Um, and also, you know, the speed at which you guys want to process these things. You don't have to do it at their speed if you don't want to. Correct. Um, but if, it, if it's possible and, it, and, and, and if it makes sense, then, you know, the city could certainly do that. Who makes the rules for the PUD? The applicant proposes what they want, and then the city can accept or not accept of what they propose. So if they come in with a plan that has just what you feel is way too much density, or the wrong kind of land uses, or it's, you feel it's poorly designed for, for some reason, during that review process with the PUD as a planning commission, you can say, no, this is not going to work. You need to come back with something else and give them that feedback. And it's a, refuse to take your suggestion, you can recommend it be denied. So they, they come in, we have a problem with this ordinance, this is what we're proposing under the 
DOD that we applied for, mm -hmm. we'd like to do this. Correct. Okay. Any other questions? Section 15.04, basis of determination. So this section sets forth what criteria you use to make your, your decision. Uh, you'll see under item A, the former number one, general standards for special land use in section 1703A. I, I took that out not because I don't like the standards, but because I think it's confusing. Because when I first read that, I thought that we also had to apply the special land use pre review process for a PUD, which is a fine thing to do, but you don't need to do that in, in addition to a rezoning to a PUD. It's kind of one or the other. So I took that out, and I'm going to add some standards for PUD review in here. To, to look at going forward. I'm, I'm assuming when you add those that you would also be looking at 1703A. There would be similar standards, yes. Um, but I would, you know, some, some of the criteria will, will be very similar, like right. uh, you know, compatibility with a master plan and effects on adjacent properties sure. and neighborhoods yeah. and things like that. Um, but I do, those are pretty general. So. Yes. And, but I don't want to specifically reference in something from a special land use you know, process because yeah. It, yeah. um, and then, in addition to whatever standards we, we add here, we'll also have to look at the standards for site plan review, which you guys should be familiar with because we go through them about once a month, uh, and other standards of, of this chapter and anything else in the urban. So, um, you know, because someone gets it, uh, if someone gets a PUD, uh, that doesn't mean that they're excused from, oh, you know, uh, locations of. It, 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 it doesn't mean that they don't have a landscape or they don't have to provide adequate parking or something like that. You can still go through and apply standards elsewhere in the ordinance and hold them to that if you want to. Um, and as a matter of process, the applicant should then they should tell you what standards they're looking to have modified or varied or they can the application. And 1504B just says that uh, the city council may impose conditions with the approval of a, of a PUD, which is very common thing to do. So they'll say, yes, we'll approve this with the following conditions. Um, a lot of them will be some sort of operational conditions similar to what we do with special land uses a lot. So um, it could be, you know, if, if, if there's a business as part of that PUD, they could say, okay, well, this business is going to be in your PUD at 10 hours of operation of such and such, or it can only occupy a certain number of square feet or whatever it is, something like that. In section 15.05, if there are no questions on that section, um, this section sets out what uses would be permitted in an in APUD. And this one we proposed to change pretty significantly. So all that was in here before it said that you could, in the APUD, you could only do single family dwellings, two family dwellings only up to a point, multi family dwellings only up to a point. So for two family, you could only do up to 20% of your PUD could be two family. Not more than 30% could be multi family. And then um, you could also allow uses permitted by right in the C1 neighborhood business district, which is a, a district that is in the ordinance but is not mapped in. There are any properties in the city zone C1 or C2 and C3, uh, but not C1. So I am proposing to simplify this a little bit. Um, I think it's, 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 it's simplifying it. So um, every property where someone would come in and ask for a PUD now, there's, it's already has an existing or underlying zoning district. So it could be R1, R2, R3, mixed use, C2. Um, so if it's permitted by right in that district now, it would be permitted within a PUD in that location. Uh, similarly, under number two, um, if it's something that's indicated in, in the master plan as a type of development that we want on this property, we would also love that in a PUD. So the master plan talks about, um, you know, di different types of land uses and different types of designs, so residential or office or retail, for example, um, you know, certain types of housing designs, neighborhood designs, if it's consistent with those underlying principles of the master plan for that location or for that designation on the master plan map, we would also consider that and possibly allow it within a PUD. Number three, residential, commercial, and public uses, which are determined to be compatible with the existing and adjacent uses and may be combined. So if you have a piece of property and you want to have um, 
some mixed use development with a public feature, a park, or a plaza, or whatever those things could be combined as a, as a single development, and that could be permitted within a PUD. Um, and then number four, which I was talking about before, only those uses approved for that PUD district shall be permitted thereafter. So um, if somebody comes in with a PUD with, with a certain number of residential units and a couple other you know, commercial or multifamily land uses, they can't just come and switch it out and do something totally different without coming back in here. So that's what I was getting at before when we say that rezoning to PUD kind of locks in those land uses. That's what that means. Once you're approved, you're approved, but then you're locked into what you propose. Is there a mechanism for them to come back? There will be. Um, so there, there, there's not really now, but we'll have similar to what we do for site plans and special uses. You know, kind of that major change versus minor change. There's a minor change where you just want to move the building 10 feet. We'll just administratively look at it. Uh, but if it's more significant than that, if it's a completely different land use or a significant increase in density or uh, new buildings or something like that, then they would have to come through and go through the process. Do, do we want to spell that out? Or yes, number we four. Yep. yep, at least we will do that. Okay. Other questions on that part? Uh, continuing in section 15.05, um, so one of the things under subsection B here, I'm on page four towards the top, um, you know, this says that the maximum number of dwellings shall be not be greater than, than whatever is the most restrictive zone district. I change that to the underlying district. So if there's a certain uh, residential density that's prescribed by the existing residential district, we would want to keep that. So in other words, if it was zoned R2 and that has a certain lot area of 10,000 square feet, the PUD doesn't just automatically let them increase the density tenfold on that property just because. So we still want them to maintain that underlying density that's permitted by that district. Just how they arrange it and put it together could look and function differently from what you would ordinarily, ordinarily see without the PUD. Uh, item C is unchanged. That talks about how, how you would determine how much, uh, how many you know, residential units you could fit on a PUD and how you do that math. Um, item D, again, is something I'm proposing to be totally delete, and that's the same thing. So this says that your setback and your re re requirements shall comply with the most restrictive zone district in which those uses are permitted. So for one, I'm not quite sure what that means. And two, it doesn't make any sense to me. The point of a PUD is to allow for flexibility and all of those things. So um, if we want to allow for that flexibility, then we shouldn't automatically require the most restrictive thing that we can find in the zoning ordinance. So I'm proposing that we take that out and, and replace it with the D right underneath it that says that the city may allow for a PUD to modify applicable bulk area setback density and other dimensional requirements of the zoning ordinance. So again, that allows for the applicant to, to propose if there's a required 35 foot setback, which, which we see a lot in R1 and R2, and they're proposing a, a different kind of neighborhood that maybe only has 20 foot front yards, but the same number of units, and it looks good, and if you guys like it, then why not? We, we could approve that. Um, similarly, if they wanted to, to uh, reduce the size of the parcels, make them a little bit narrower than what's ordinarily permitted, you could approve that too. Now, the underlying density would stay the same with everything else. Um, actually, I should take that part out. But um, everything else would pretty much be flexible. So the idea with, with D is, is flexibility. Um, I, don't, I, I, I think I would agree uh, about taking that density yeah. and just take it right out and get it out of there because that's going to be. Yep, that's going to add. That's in center Yeah. Um, and then under item F, non-residential uses, a lot of PUDs, especially ones, you know, these ordinances like this that have been around for a while, they allow for some mixed uses, but not only on a very limited basis. And again, I think this language was written for purely single-family residential PUDs, which may be a couple of apartments or duplexes or something. Um, I don't think it was intended for redevelopment or, or new development in town and more urban setting. I think this is kind of a suburban style ordinance, which in some areas fits in certain parts of the city, but in a lot of ways it doesn't because 
guys just don't have the room or the, the framework really to have that kind of a project. So um, this language here that says all resident, non-residential uses shall occupy no more than 10% of the PUD project's developable area, I'm proposing we just take that right out. Um, if they want to allow for a significantly majorly mixed use project, that's fine. And if it's consistent with the master plan and meets those other standards, then you could approve it. And if it's not, then you could say no. Um, so this is going to change it a little bit. We're, we're going to rely more heavily on the underlying district and the master plan to control land use than what's in here. The other items here under subsection F are going to stay put, basically. So I have a question on uh, yeah. three. Yeah, so sure. merchandise for display sale or lease shall be entirely within an enclosed building. Mm -hmm. What happens if it's associated with a river and you want to have a kayak sitting out there? I mean, that seems kind of silly yeah. uh, to have it in here. Mm -hmm. like that. I, yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd like a rework of that. So okay. I, I don't, I, you know, if the intent here is to keep it orderly and all of that, that's one thing. But there are some businesses that that doesn't mm -hmm. make any sense for. Or it could be, for that matter, it could be a restaurant with a table outside on the on the river. Yeah. The it just doesn't make any sense with our location here. Yeah, we can. I I have some ideas on how to change that. Any other questions or comments on this? Um, the last item here, number four, and we have a little iffy on this, to be honest with you. Uh, I haven't decided if I want to keep this or not. So again, what we see a lot is uh, language and ordinance, ordinances that require that before you build any non-residential buildings, they have to have at least 75 or 80 percent or whatever of your residential uses built before you can build the non residential stuff. Um, and I think that's in here so that if somebody really wants to build a commercial building where it doesn't fit, they could say, oh yeah, well, we're, we're going to do this whole residential PUD that they know is never going to work. And then they, and then they just, we'll just put our, our, our commercial building up and oh well, the residential part just doesn't work. So we just, so they can kind of back their way into a little bit of a rezoning. That's why that's in here. I'm not, sh and I get the logic, but I don't know if it makes sense in all circumstances. So I'm going to have to think through that one a little bit more, um, and either keep it or, or you know, propose some, some alternate language. Maybe if it's all integrated into the same building, it's less of an issue. Um, but I think the idea here is to not have one commercial building with 50 <coughs> vacant residential lots just sitting there, not doing anything. It's going to force the, the uh, developer to put forth a feasible plan for multiple uses that there are. Going Maybe to some do. language that would say you can't stage it or uh, it can't be done in stages or something like that. Unless there's a material reason for it. Mm -hmm. Something. Yeah. Like yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll have to, I'll think about this one. Um, I was looking at it today and I couldn't decide if I wanted to get rid of it or not. So I left it for now. Okay. Um, 15.06 relates to open space. Um, so as I said, a lot of PUDs come around because there's a desire to uh, build on smaller lots and have a large amount of undeveloped open space on properties. And so if, if that is going to be uh, proposed and allowed, 15.06 uh, would control uh, the, the regulation for, for those open space. I don't really have any issues with, with, with any of them. Um, you know, two just, uh, I'm on top of page five, number two requires that they be large enough to be usable. And sometimes we see these little skinny 10 or 15 foot wide perimeter strips around a development that they call open space that really doesn't function as that. Um, so we want to make sure that it's usable for everybody within the PUD. Uh, three, they have to be able to maintain it and provide the city some assurance that they can do so in a workable plan. Um, four allows there to be either for active or passive recreation. So sometimes open space in a PUD is wetlands and trees and creeks and lakes and things like that. Sometimes it's baseball fields or playgrounds or open greens or plazas or swimming pools or whatever. So it, it can be either one. We're not boxing in there one, one specific type of uh, open space. 
Number five requires that that open space be deed restricted and set aside in perpetuity. Um, and number six uh, requires that all the property owners within the PUD own, own that open space jointly. So typically that takes the form of a homeowners association or a kind of mini association where the owners all have a joint interest in that, that common element, as, as they call it, and everyone's equally responsible for, for maintaining it. Um, number seven pertains to maintenance, um, and number so, and that's when when, when it's talking about you know active versus passive. I mean, we're not going to make somebody mow everything, obviously, if it's a if it's a natural area, um, but they do have to keep it clean, uh, keep it maintained uh, as is reasonable, and they'll have to provide the city of evidence that they have a plan for doing that. Um, and number eight is a standard that uh, requires that to the extent possible open space within a PUD be uh, conti continuous and contiguous. So you don't want little itty bitty pockets here and there that are totally disconnected and don't really serve any greater function to the entire neighborhood. If that's the case, we want it to be a, a larger connected communal kind of gathering space, the natural area, whatever it is that, that really furthers the city's master plan and the objectives of the chapter. Um, so that brings it to a conclusion. There are a few additional procedural things that I mentioned I want to add. Um, this came up kind of last minute, so I, I apologize for, for getting this to you in a very rough form at the last minute. Um, that's not typically the way that uh, I'd like to uh, work on these things, but um, you know, timing was is and was uh, important. So um, you know, I'd like to keep this moving along as much as is, as is possible. And um, I guess Bruce, if you have questions, uh, commissioners, uh, questions at all? You said there was some possible interest. This is what stemmed first started this. Correct. Can you? Tell us, or not? I don't think so. Okay. Um, in in the interest of, of time, however, can you? Um, I, my my first drillers would be to receive all of the updates mm -hmm. and and go over those at the October eighth meeting. Not not set a public hearing. Mm -hmm. Go over those at that meeting. Um, does that conflict with your schedule horribly or not? I mean, that would be my. My only concern is yeah. that we're, we're holding a public hearing. Right, we don't have. Right, you should know if you're holding a public hearing. Exactly. Right. Yeah, that's um, that's a little uh, disconcerting. You know, I, I agree. I, I guess my suggestion would would, would 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 be to move at at the pace that you are comfortable moving. Um, I don't want you to adopt something that you're not comfortable with. Obviously, um, you know, as far as what's happening, I can't say for sure how it it would be received, but you know. Like I said, I don't want you, if you're not comfortable just sending something on um, or holding a hearing on something, you're not entirely sure that you digested all of it, you know, I, I don't know that I would advocate for that. So, so the, other, so the other possibility there would be to hold a, a special public hearing meeting later in October. Yeah, no, no, that, that would be another possibility if that's mm -hmm. what is absolutely necessary. Again, my preference would be to hold our session on October 8th with this not as a public hearing, but mm -hmm. just going over this and finalizing it, scheduling a public hearing at the November mm -hmm. meeting. But if that doesn't work, then then we you, you could let us know at the October meeting, yeah. and then we could go ahead and schedule something. Yes, let's do that. If yeah. everybody's in agreement. Yeah, so I, from my perspective, that's fine. We can give you the, the complete kind of marked up and final version for October. Um, we'll have some more answers for you at that point. Okay. And, um, then if we need to schedule a public hearing before your November meeting, we can do that. Okay. Otherwise, we can just continue on planning and meet on this in but, November. And let's pass that around, around. commissioners. Is everybody okay with that? Uh -huh. Yeah. I, I, I know I don't feel comfortable holding a public we'll hearing. We'll see what we Exactly. Set up. Yeah, I, I just don't feel comfortable doing that, so, um, at all, I mean, frankly. So. But I don't, I, I, in fairness too, I don't mind holding an extra public hearing uh, late in October if we have to. That 
seems to be a reasonable one. If anybody's looking at it in the long run, it shouldn't matter to them one way or so. In the long run. So, okay. All right. And did anybody have any questions on the residential zoning before we get too far here? So we're going to do a public hearing on that, uh, that whole session on October 8th at a regular meeting, okay? And then we also will do the planned unit development, our regular session. We'll talk about this and try to finalize uh, what we want to do there. Not pass anything, update, not do anything. All those options are on the table, but, um, you know, we need to take a, a, a look at it and go from there. So, okay. Andy, do you have anything else? Um, I don't think so. Is there anything, Sue, that we needed to add for? Okay. I'm good. Staff, Sue, anything? I have nothing further to report. Okay. Kelly, you're first up. I'm good. I'm good. No. Good. All right. And I'm not going to upset the carpet. Okay. <laughs> I'm good as well. Fine. Uh, and I'm doing fine. I just got back from UP and getting ready to go to London. So we're, uh, we're in between. So we're doing good. Um, do I have a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. And support? Support. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Stand adjourned. Thank you.